Hi, I'm Travis and this is Curious Tangents, and you and your siblings share about 50% of the same DNA. On top of that, you were probably raised in the same household. However, you and your siblings are not the same. In psychology, there's a debate between nature, your genetics, and nurture, your experiences. Or at least, there used to be. Today, we know that both environment and genetics play an integral part in who you are. That being said, your siblings share a significant portion of your DNA and your life experiences. So why aren't your siblings you? But first, let's tell a story about genetics. There were two brothers, one named J and the other named B. The first brother, Jay, would graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy, become a successful businessman, and later become the governor of Georgia. Then he would become a human rights activist and even win a Nobel Prize. His brother, B, would work on the family peanut farm and never finish college. He did end up owning a gas station and becoming a spokesperson for a beer company. You might have figured this out, but the first person was 39th President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. The second person you probably didn't figure out. It's his baby brother, Billy Carter, who would publicly and infamously urinate on an airport runway. Now, from what I read, Billy was a bang up guy and he did well in life and he made decent choices. Other than peeing on that runway, I don't recommend you do that. In the beginning of this video, I said a statistic that you have probably heard before. You and your siblings share 50% of the same DNA. This is only kind of true. You see, across all of humanity, we share about 99% of the same DNA. Now that number does change because genetics is ever evolving. This means that if you take a random stranger from another country and compared all of their genes to yours, 99% of them would be the same. However, if you did that with your sibling, there would be an extra 50%. You and your siblings are actually 99.5% the same. The genetic code works a whole lot like a phone number. If I ask a girl for her number and she gives me a fake one, which would never happen because I don't approach women that I'm attracted to, let's say she only changes the last number from a three to a four. That's a change of a single digit, but when I go to call it, I'm not going to get someone who's like the girl that I was talking to. I'll get a completely different person. Similarly, changing one single gene can give you a completely different person. And the same can be true of genetics. Changing one gene can do a lot, or effectively nothing, depending on what gene it is. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic blood disorder that changes the shape of red blood cells. The typical donut shape becomes a sickle shape that is not as effective at carrying oxygen and also has a shorter lifespan. This is a disease primarily found in people of African descent, as having a copy of the gene makes you nearly immune to malaria, a major cause of death in Africa. But if a person has two copies of the allele, or version of a gene, that causes this, then without proper treatment, they may not live into adulthood. And this life-altering change is caused by a single gene mutation on the hemoglobin beta gene found on chromosome 11. The point being, one thing can change your life. There are also many genes that are significantly more complicated than this. For instance, there is no single gene for consciousness, or for that matter, extroversion, or neuroticism, or conscientiousness. Your personality is caused for the part that it is nature, by a combination of different genes interacting with one another. During conception, the 50% of the genes from your mom and dad don't just combine, they go through a process called recombination. This means that the genes that you have and the genes that your brother have may be 50% the same, but in a completely different order. In fact, unless you have a twin, that is likely the outcome. Imagine that same fake number that I got earlier in the video, but this time the numbers are being scrambled rather than faked. And as far as we know right now, having just part of the genes for extroversion might make you an introvert. Adding to the already complex nature of genetics, there are emergenic traits. Emergence shows up in a lot of different things. Emergence is when a bunch of simple things come together to form something more complex. For instance, your body is composed of 37 trillion individual cells. You, on the other hand, are more complex than any of those individual cells. 
They're working together to form you, a conscious being. In fact, you might even be one of the most complex structures in the known universe. Maybe. But each of those individual cells by themselves are not that impressive. They keep you alive, yes, but none of them could say build the pyramids or cure diseases. That has to be done by something more complicated. The same phenomena can be seen in birds. Birds flying individually have behavior that's different from a flock of birds flying together, as if the flock has its own mind. Like this flock of birds, you are more than the sum of your parts, and so are your genetics. Unlike the singular and pinpointable traits that cause sickle cell anemia, emergent characteristics, although genetic, do not run in families. They're caused by the unique combination of genetics that you have. There's no single trait for consciousness. Consciousness is an immergenic trait that we all have in common. This is because these characteristics are caused by your unique combination of genes. Not just having the genes, but the way those genes function together. Think of the way that beehives behave in a different and more complex way than any individual bee, or how flocks of birds move differently than any individual bird flying within it. Like these things, you and your genetics are more than the sum of your parts. If you were to share 50% of the genetic combinations that cause an emergent characteristic, then you might not have any of that emergent characteristic. This means that having 50% of the genes that cause an emergent trait like extroversion might lead to a person who is incredibly introverted. We also tend to overestimate the amount of which our environment is stable. Just because you and your sister were raised by the same parents, doesn't mean it was the same situation. Five years ago, when you were five years old, you might have been economically stable. But when your little sister is five years old, five years later, your parents may be facing economic hardships. So far, the consensus is that environments are easier to understand than our genetics. At the time of my recording this, 2020, we do not fully understand human genetics, though we have gained a lot of ground thanks to projects like the Human Genome Project or CRISPR, which is essentially genetic engineering, we have gained the ability to edit ourselves. And with this knowledge, this ability, sickle cell anemia, a disease with no cure which has killed millions, may soon belong only to a primitive past. And with it will go many other genetic diseases. Cystic fibrosis and Tay-Sachs disease will go as well. But why stop at simple disease prevention? Why not make the child better suited to living a better life in general? And maybe even resistance to some diseases that are not genetic. Why not build a baby who will grow up not just with an immunity to depression, but with a proclivity towards happiness? You could build babies who are smarter, taller, faster, and stronger than their regular counterparts. Better in every single way. And why not do it? Some would see it as our moral obligation to make humanity a better, stronger species. But to this, there is moral opposition. CRISPR comes with a price tag, a price tag that means a large portion of humanity will be excluded from using it. Opposition that will be led by questions like, is it moral to have an imperfect child in a world where perfect children are an option? How do we adapt to a world where we will be obsolete not because of socioeconomic inequality, but because of genetic normalcy. How will the countries who decide that genetic engineering is unethical and outlawed compete with the countries who genetically engineer their citizens to be smarter, faster, and stronger than the average human being? And within those nations, how will the children of those who could not afford genetic engineering compete with their now perfect peers. After generations of selective genetic engineering, will we still consider those who have been genetically engineered human? Or better yet, will they consider us to be human? Or will Homo sapiens be a thing of an obsolete and primitive past, like the Neanderthals before us? The question which gave me all of these questions was why are siblings different? which I ask in 2020. The answer comes down to environmental changes and inherent differences. When asking why siblings are so different 100 years from now, the answer might be because mom and dad could afford to genetically engineer one twin and not the other. 
and thank you for watching. Hey, so if you like this video, like and share this video and do all of the things that you do on other YouTube videos that you like. And also, I have a Patreon. It's a work in progress, but it exists. This was shot before editing, so I have no idea how long this is, but it was a really long video, I'm sure. So thank you for watching.